I'm so excited to be here. It is really a huge, huge, huge honor, Pastor Herman, for me to be here with you on this uh, celebration week leading up to the gala on Saturday night. Who's excited about the gala? Again, so excited about that. And I also want to welcome everybody joining us on the live stream and at the San Jose campus. I was born and raised in San Jose, so love you all down there. I uh, feel I represent not only Twin Lakes Church, but also the whole community of Bible-believing churches here in the whole broader Bay Area, from Monterey all the way up to Marin and beyond. And on their behalf, I just want to bring heartfelt congratulations on NBCC's 10th birthday. And we just want to praise God with you for what he has done through you. Praise the Lord. And I truly love... I, I, I gotta tell you, I gotta return the, the the praise. I love Pastor Herman and and Rhonda. They have both spoken. Both Herman and Rhonda have spoken at our church, and they are well loved by our people. And I have to say, I personally appreciate Herman so much. How he helps lead a fellowship of pastors called TBC, and this uh, fellowship brings together. I don't know if we got a, a slide of Herman with some of the TBC pastors here. Uh, and that's just a, uh, the tip of the iceberg. TBC, that stands for Transforming the Bay with Christ, this brings together over 100 congregations from all sorts of different ethnic uh, groups and language groups and, uh, and denominational groups and geographic groups. Talk about diversity and unity in Jesus Christ. And Herman's on the board of TBC, a very small board. Herman's one of the leaders. And they bring these congregations together, and as you mentioned, as a part of that, this fall, many of those churches are going through this series on Simon Peter called Flawed Follower, and our church, Twin Lakes Church, is going to be doing that along with NBCC and many others, and I think that begins here in just a couple of weekends, and so we're very excited about that. And by way of personal introduction, here's uh, Lori. I think we got a picture of her up here along with our five grandkids. Uh, there they are. Uh, Emmett. Uh, in the middle there with my daughter Elizabeth. He is three years old, and Danny is five years old, and Freddie is eight years old, and we have two two-year-old uh, granddaughters, Amelia and Wilhelmina, and we also have some adult children, but really, who cares about them? And on this, uh, <laughs> but on this special week celebrating the 10th anniversary of your congregation, I've been praying about what to talk about, and I want to ask, why is NBCC here? Or why is any church here? Why did Jesus invent church? You know, think about this. We have hospitals for medical needs. We have government for infrastructure needs. We have in and out for hamburger needs. Why are there churches? We take it for granted that there were always things like what we get to enjoy as churches, but really in the ancient world, religion did not work like this. Religion in the ancient world meant one thing. It meant a temple, it meant sacrifices, it meant priests, it meant rituals. You went to the temple to get the priest to sacrifice on your behalf, and then you left. Jesus invented what we know of here today as church. This was an innovation. And I really want to talk about this today because we are in a cultural moment where every institution is distrusted. And my goal here this morning is to get you all to cherish this church and to cherish Jesus Christ's vision for church in general and to love what Jesus did in inventing church and to see the value of what you have here in this congregation today. And I want to suggest to you that Jesus invented church really because of the deepest human need of all. And it's a need that's universal and I want to demonstrate it to you this way. One of the last things Elvis Presley ever wrote was a note the morning he died, and it read in part, I feel so alone sometimes. Help me, Lord. Elvis alone? He was surrounded by admirers. He was surrounded by fame and success. Alfred Hitchcock, most famous film director of his day, some of his very final words on his deathbed, I am lost in a sea of alone. 
Albert Einstein, probably the most recognizable face of the 20th century, said, it is strange to be known so universally and yet to be so alone. I mean, are you kidding me? Elvis, Hitchcock, Einstein, three of the 20th century's icons. Plenty of fame, plenty of success, plenty of friends, yet still somehow alone. What is the cure for this deep down loneliness? Well, of course, I believe we're all longing for a connection to God. I mean, all of us. Look at this. Just recently, brand new poll, Pastor Herman. This was just released this year. We hear about people, oh, people are leaving religion, they're leaving church. Look at this. When people in America were asked what they desire for their future, number one response, 75% of U.S. adults said a close relationship with God. Even today. Well, the good news is that God offers exactly that, right? The Bible is fundamentally a love story. And I could show you a hundred verses at least, but look at these. Love comes from God in 1 John 4, 7. God is love in 1 John 4, 16. Oh, what about Ephesians 3? May you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep His love is. It's all about love. Somebody say it's all about love. It's all about love. Our faith is not primarily about rules or regulations or rituals. Our faith is about relationship. Now, follow me here. This is why Jesus invented church. Because our faith is primarily about relationship. It's only in community that love can truly be known and shown. Do you see what I'm saying here? You can philosophize about love alone. But you can only actually love in community. You know, sometimes uh, people tell me, you know, Pastor, I don't need church because I can worship God in the forest. And I often say to them, well, I, I love that you worship God in the forest. I hope you worship God in the forest. But a tree's not going to visit you in the hospital. And that's why we need community, because it's in community that love is known and shown. Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you what? Love one another. If our faith was primarily about rules, Jesus would have just dropped a rule book from heaven. If our faith was primarily about doctrine, he would have just dropped a textbook. But our faith, while of course, those are part of our faith, but our faith is primarily about the love of God and knowing the love of God. And so Jesus invented church because it's only in community that love can be known and shown. And that's the primary purpose that we're all here. I love what John Mark Comer says. He says, ever notice when Jesus shows up, one of the first things he does is create a community. And think of his commitment to this. Jesus himself lived in community. Jesus was not, except for those 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus was not some hermit up on a mountaintop somewhere. Even though he probably could have been a hermit and been the most amazing human being ever, even as a hermit. But Jesus Christ chose to live in a community full of flawed followers like Simon Peter. Not only that, but the call to follow him was a call to join his community. Jesus Christ does not say, hey, everybody, here's some inspiring content. Now, good luck. Go be a peaced out monk somewhere up on a mountain all alone. No, he says, let's do this together. Follow me together. He does not just say, here's a philosophy. Go live by it. He says, here's love. Go live in it. And you can only do that in community, which is why I invented church. And what's more, Jesus called people to community who were natural enemies. Natural enemies. I mean, just think of who was in that original crowd of 12 disciples. The only two people whose occupations are mentioned, as many people have pointed out, are Matthew the what? Tax collector. And Simon the what? The zealot. Now, if you know anything about first century politics, you know you could not possibly have found two people further apart politically. Tax collectors 
collaborated with the oppressive Roman government. And the zealots believed in overthrowing that oppressive Roman government by any means necessary. Can you imagine the dinner conversations among those two and the apostles? This is like inviting your progressive college student niece and your MAGA hat wearing uncle to Thanksgiving dinner and just waiting for the sparks to fly times a thousand. But do you understand this was not a mistake? Jesus didn't choose Matthew and Simon and say, oh my goodness, I didn't realize he was a tax collector. I didn't realize he was a zealot. Jesus did this on purpose, showing from the start, I want my church to be like this. Why? Because no other community on earth is like that. And I believe this is something America and the Bay Area is just thirsting for right now. Jesus is telling us in the church that it's really possible to have deep communion with people that you don't really have a lot of political or pop cultural or family chemistry with. Jesus is showing that Christian community isn't the same as any other kind of community. Here, we don't get together because it's kind of nice to be with other people who think exactly the same way you do. Like every bullet point down the political, theological, behavioral, ethnic, whatever list. There, that's how every other community is. We don't get together because we can kind of reaffirm all of one another's ideas or whatever. That's not it at all. What the church is meant to be like is kind of like a Venn diagram where we actually do not overlap a lot. But where we do overlap is the most important thing of all, which is Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. And from the very beginning, from the very beginning, this was meant to be a group of extremely diverse people who find unity in the one thing that transcends culture, the love of God for us. Let me just be clear about this. I'm talking about people who are Democrats, Republicans, independents, citizens, not citizens, old, young, rich, poor, unhoused, and CEOs, black and white and brown and men and women, to show how we overlap in Jesus. People long for this kind of community. And again, this is why Jesus invented church and gave us church and not just a booklet and not just a podcast, and not just an idea, because he is reaching the world through community, and he cannot do it without healthy church communities like NBCC. You know, I'm, I'm so grateful that I visited NBCC kind of anonymously last year, just kind of to check it out, to be here with my friend Herman as he preached, and I loved it. Man, I definitely felt this love vibe. I've seen and felt this kind of community, this diverse community here. And I love it because that's the purpose of the church. It's all about love. Say it again. It's all about love. It's all about love. Let's talk specifically about the three ways that as churches, God wants us to bear the message of love to our community. This is why NBCC is here. I mean, I know that Pastor Herman and the, the leaders of the church have a specific version for NBCC in this community, but I'm talking about Church, why, why Twin Lakes Church, my church is here, why, NBC, why any church is here according to Jesus. Number one, we're here to proclaim God's love. We're here to proclaim God's love. That's the primary purpose. We're not here to judge people. I mean, Jesus specifically told us that. We're not here to correct people. We're not here to inspect people. We're not here to direct people. We're here to, to, to infect people with the love of God through Jesus Christ. And people need this. Arthur Miller, the famous playwright, wrote Death of a Salesman. Uh, he wrote about what it was like to be married to Marilyn Monroe. What a couple. During the filming of her last movie, he watched her spiraling down. And one night, as Arthur Miller, you know, just a master wordsmith, stood watching his wife, Marilyn Monroe, sleeping. He wrote this, I found myself imagining, what if she were to wake and I were able to look her in the eyes and say, 
God loves you, darling. And what if she were able to believe it? How I wish I still had my religion and she hers. That is sad on so many levels. He was smart enough to know that this was what she needed. This is what everybody needs. And, and, and what I'm saying to you is what God wants us to do when people come into our fellowship here, whether it's NBCC or TLC, is for us to play the role for people in our, in our churches that Arthur Miller wished he could have played for Marilyn. To look him in the eyes and say, God loves you. And we, look around, we love you with no hesitation. And it's his love you've been looking for for all your life. Because what happens to people when they find the love of God? I love this verse. The Bible says, the beloved of the Lord rests secure in him. He rests between his shoulders. Rest between his shoulders. What could that mean? Well, it's kind of like this. A small child on her dad's shoulders, like my granddaughter Willa here. She's on my son David's shoulders after church recently. There she is. She knows she is beloved. She rests secure between her daddy's shoulders. And that's the feeling we want people to receive when they walk into our congregations. That is our message. To say to people, maybe your whole life you have felt like an outsider to some degree in every other community, but you are loved here. We're here to proclaim God's love, and second, we're here to explain God's love, to explain God's love. Years ago, Lori and I were returning from a long vacation, and we were expecting our first baby, and we landed in the United States for a customs check, and then we were supposed to catch another domestic flight home. So you got the picture? We're landing for a customs check in a big international airport, and then we're going to catch a small flight home. Now remember, Lori's expecting and she is just very close to delivering that baby. And she just wanted to really get on the next plane to go home. She was tired. She was done. But when we get to the customs line, it's super long. You can hardly see the end of it. And it looks like we're going to miss our connecting flight home. And she was mad. And she told me, Renee, go to the front of the line. I said, what? <laughs> she said, you tell the customs people that your wife is pregnant. And you ask them if we can skip the line because your wife is pregnant. And I was about to say, that is ridiculous. And she gives me that mama bear look like, I am six months pregnant. Do not mess with me. And I said, yes, ma'am. And so I hurried to the customs official at the front of the line. I said, look, I know this is out of the ordinary, but my wife is pregnant. And I'm very afraid of her right now. And so... I I, I don't know how to ask this, but she asked me to ask you if you could just bump us to the front of the line. She wants to take cuts over 200 people because she's pregnant and we want to make our flight. And he looks at me, and I figured he was just going to say no, and I could go back to Lori and say, well, I tried. And he looks at me and he says, hmm. He says, what's your job? <laughs> I don't know why he asked me this. And I said, I, I don't know whether to tell him I'm a pastor or not, because I'm not, never sure what kind of response that's going to elicit from people. I said, well, I'm a pastor. And he, he, he looks at me and goes, right. He says, you have no idea how many people try that one on me. And I thought, really? And then he says this. He says, if you're really a pastor, recite John 3.16. <laughs> Like, no one but a pastor could possibly know this secret code. <laughs> and so he folds his arms and glares at me, and I'm looking at him, and I, I glance back down the line, and Lori's folding her arms, and she's glaring at me, and I think, under this kind of pressure, I'm going to choke. I'm going to end up spitting out the Gettysburg Address or something. And so I take a deep breath, and I say, okay, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And he looks at me and he says, wow, you must be a pastor. Move to the front of the line, Reverend, and I got it. <laughs> no kidding. That's a true story. Well, here's the thing about this famous verse. It's so famous 
so many of us know John 3.16 that we forget its meaning, right? It may seem obvious to you, but John 3.16 is preceded by John 3.14 and 15, which really help us understand this. Check out the context. Jesus says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert... So the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Now, what is all that? That is referring to a strange story back in the book of Numbers, chapter 21. The Israelites are in the desert, and they're all dying of poisonous snake bites, and they are all doomed. There's no antidote. So God says to Moses, I'm going to do a miracle. He says, make a brass symbol of a snake. Watch this now. Put it up on a pole, lift it up, and anybody who merely looks on it, that's all they have to do, is to look on it with faith, they're going to be healed by my grace. And that, by the way, is a possible origin of the caduceus, a symbol for uh, the physician uh, profession, the serpent on a pole. But I love the poetic way that God heals here. He takes the very symbol of death, the snake, and turns it into a symbol of life and healing. So do you see the parallels? We're dying of a poison in our soul, sin. And so Jesus Christ is sacrificed on a cross, a symbol of death. And we just behold him in faith and we're healed. So now that you know the preceding two verses, look again at the well-known words in John 3.16. For God so loved. He didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't look on in anger or apathy. He deeply, expensively loved the world. Every child, every man, every woman, every lawbreaker, every law enforcer, me, you, that he gave, not demanded, not just even instructed. He gave. It's a gift. It's grace. His one and only son. He didn't just give principles. He gave a person. That everyone who believes him, not whoever works hardest, not whoever prays the most, whoever believes shall not perish. That means we're all perishing without him in every way anyway. But with him, we have eternal life, both forever life and rich life. And it's really that simple. Now, the Israelites, when they looked up that serpent, they didn't have to know exactly how Looking up on that serpent in faith healed them of the snake's toxin. In fact, it was miraculous. They just know that when they looked upon that snake in faith, they were healed. And the point is, you don't have to know exactly how this all works either. As A.W. Tozer says, we're saved by his death, but how are we saved by his death? We're alive by his resurrection, but how are we alive by his resurrection? At some point, it's just a miracle, unfathomable. And we simply stand and gaze at the cross and whisper, Thank you. And here's the thing. When you realize how unconditionally God loves you, as Tozer says, what can the world do to a man or a woman who is grounded in the love of God, who swims in the ocean of his love as a fish swims in the sea? What can sin do? What can the world do? What can accident do? And so we are here as churches to be communities of love that are diverse and, and, and so different, but we overlap on Jesus so that we can proclaim the love of God and explain the love of God, and third, that we can live out the love of God. Now, what do I mean by that? How do we live it out? Well, think of what you do when you love anybody. When you love somebody, you listen to what they say, and we do that together when we listen to his word proclaimed. And when you love somebody, you tell them that you love them and you thank them for what they do. And that's what community worship is, which we just got to enjoy. We're telling God we love him. And when you love someone, you serve them in love, don't you? Now, how much would you love to just lavish love on Jesus for saving you? Wouldn't it be amazing if Jesus was here and you could just say, well, can I bring you some coffee? Can, can I, what do you need? I'll do anything for you, Lord. Well, Jesus says that's exactly what you do when you serve others. You're serving him. But the point is, you can't really do this well alone. We do all of this in community together. So don't you just love the idea of church? Who's glad that Jesus invented church? Isn't this a beautiful thing? 
Now, if this is all so beautiful, why is church so hard sometimes? What keeps us from enjoying this beautiful invention of Jesus Christ? Well, I mean, I think the obvious thing is just busyness. People get busy and they, they forget to actually show up and fellowship and enjoy all this beauty. And not just enjoy it for themselves, but to radiate God's love to other people in community, which is, as we establish, such a deep need. But I think there's two other reasons that people don't enjoy church. Idealism and fear. And what I mean by idealism is I, I, we t sometimes think, when, when I get into, into a church, when I find, I'm going to church shop, and I'm going to look for the perfect church, you see. And when I find the perfect church, they're all going to be beautiful people. And they're always going to be loving, and they're not going to have any body odor, and they're going to see everything in my enlightened way. And then we get into a church, and we thought it was pretty cool, but we find out the people are inconsistent. And sometimes they're grumpy. Sometimes they're moody. And sometimes they have body odor. And sometimes they disagree with my biblically-based politics. And we can get disillusioned. And we think, what do I have in common with these people? And this unattainable idealism, follow me here, is one of the biggest reasons people just give up on church. Well, but it wasn't perfect. I would say this, don't trade the beautiful real for the unattainable ideal. Don't change the beautiful real for the unattainable ideal. There's too much of that going on in the world today. People are looking for increasingly tiny echo chambers of seemingly perfect people who always agree with them on every single thing. Don't do that when you're looking for a church because you know what? There's a word for that. Cult. Real community is real people. Being honest, being real, being imperfect, right? And growing together in love. It's not love if everybody's perfect and it's not hard to love them. That's not love. That's just, a, that's just a narcissism. That's just ego gratification. It's love when you have to reach across a barrier and sacrifice to love somebody. And that's what Jesus wants to show in churches. And then the second thing is fear. Church can be scary. You can be hurt in a church. People are weird. People can hurt you. And, and some of you, maybe some of you joining us online too, have been hurt so badly in a church that, that I, if I'd been hurt as, hurt as badly as some of you, I'd probably be hesitant to enter into a fellowship. But I will say this. If you just put a shell around yourself so you never get hurt, guess what happens? You still get hurt. You still get hurt because life and you get hurt while never experiencing the beauty of a healing community. And so learn to enjoy this. Jesus created a community of followers so that the world could see love and be loved into his family. And that's why NBCC is here. This is what Jesus Christ is putting together. And this, this is what Jesus Christ is creating still. This is what Jesus, if our eyes are open to this, this is what we see Jesus creating all the time. All the time. He's bringing diverse people together into church. Maybe some people that are hard to love or a little different or a little weird. Because that's exactly what he did from day one. And if we get in on that, then it's something really thrilling, really exciting. And I know that's Pastor Herman's heart because we've talked about it. Let me close with this. I saw a great example of how Jesus does this. At the church I pastored prior to Twin Lakes Church, I was pastoring a church up at Lake Tahoe. And the church was small, but it was really growing. And uh, I was looking ahead to Easter and realizing our church was far too small. We were packed out already. And we were far too small for our Easter services. So, you know, I started thinking, where, where, where can we meet? We didn't have any place like the Fox Theater at the time up at, up at Tahoe for us to go when we wanted to have a big gathering. The only place I could think of was the casinos up there. Now this was a, at the time, it was a 
I don't want to say the denomination, but a very fundamentalist denomination that believed in second degree separation. That is, not only do you not hang out with sinful people, you don't hang out with Christians who hang out with sinful people because you just don't want to get tainted by all the bad people. And so I was trying to kind of expand their idea a little bit into what we've been talking about here. And so I wrote Harvey's Casino, one of the big casinos, and I said, can we have church in your casino on Easter Sunday morning? I, I did not ask the church board for permission. Sometimes it's just better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Amen, Herman? <laughs> So I didn't hear back from them, and I thought they probably looked at the letter and just threw it away. That's such, they, they don't, they're not interested in having church people in a casino. So a couple of months later, this guy comes up to me after church. He's this kind of vaguely East Coast-looking dude, silk-suited, gold chain wearing, heavy cologne, black hair slicked back with lots of product. He got the idea, Rolex on his wrist. He comes up to me and he says, just like this. And Lori can vouch for this. He goes, hey, preach. My name's Pasquale Penna. Pasquale Penna was his name. My name's Pasquale Penna. I just want you to know I accepted Jesus a few weeks back here at your church. It's made all the difference in my life. You know what I'm talking about. And I said, oh, that's great, Pasquale. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, another thing. He says, I want you to know I got your letter. And I thought it might have been a letter. Maybe he indicated on a connection card that he accepted Christ. And I said, oh, that's great. He goes, no, I got that letter, too. I'm talking about the other letter you sent to Harvey's Casino. You see, I'm the uh, administrator of said facility. He said it just exactly like that. Uh, I said, oh, man, I, I, you don't have to decline. I, I know that was a nutty idea, uh, and I, I, I really don't expect it. And he goes, don't worry about it. I'll fix you up just fine. <laughs> I said, well, I, I don't know if we can afford the rates, you know, because this is a place where, you know, they got, at the time, you know, they had, like, Donna Summer and, and all these big acts, you know, and I said, I don't think we get, it goes, don't worry about it. I said, I'll fix you up. <laughs> I said, well, I, we don't really have any, like the, like, the right portable sound equipment and stuff, and he says, I told you, don't worry about it. So I'm thinking, great, now I'm doing church with, like, the Sopranos, and I can't get out of it. So I proceeded, because I was slightly afraid that if I didn't, Pasquale would send the big man to my house to break my legs. So I talked the church into doing this. So that year, Harvey's marketing campaign was the parties at Harvey's. And so what we did was we put, <laughs> put up signs all over town that said, Jesus is risen, the party's at Harvey's. <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> but it gets better. So some people who don't attend our church hear about this. They worked lights at a competitor casino, uh, Sounded Lights, called, called Harris. And they call me up at the church office. They said, yeah, our whole, church, our whole department, the whole AV department at Harris, we decided we want to volunteer to help you run Sounded Lights professionally at this Easter thing you're doing across the street. And so we ended up having an all-pro tech team, and they all start attending church and start finding new life in Jesus Christ after the service. So Easter morning... I'm sitting in a Harvey's Casino on the edge of the stage. It's just me and my new mafia friend, Pasquale. And I, I got to tell you, I was wondering if anybody's going to show up because I thought, who comes to a casino to go to church? And people begin to trickle in. And soon 300 people are there, 500, 700, 8, 9, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200. And we ended up having the largest church gathering in the history of Lake Tahoe and it's in a casino, but it gets better because little did I know that Harvey's had employed a guy who was nearly seven feet tall, who was a comedian and a juggler to dress up as the Easter Bunny. And I mean a full, like when you see Mickey Mouse at Disneyland, full head, his, his body was hidden inside this giant 
Easter Bunny costume because Harvey's the Harvey's, you know, rabbit. And so he's strolling around the casino floor handing out Easter eggs to people like Harvey's had asked him to do on the casino floor and juggling Easter eggs and so on. Bless you. And uh, he, I'm licensed to do that. Bless you, sister. And uh, he, he sees people coming in to go to church. He says, what's our, oh, we're going to a church service over here. And he goes, a church service? I've wanted to get back to church for 20 years. And so he goes to his boss. He says, I know I get a half an hour break. I want to take my break to go to church. And the boss says, well, you only get a half an hour. That's not enough time to get you out of costume. And he says, I can just take off my, my head. And he says, I don't want kids to look back there and see the Easter bunny decapitated. He goes, you can go to the church on your break if you want to, but you got to dress as the Easter bunny. He says, then I will. So I get up there to preach. He's only got a half an hour, so he decides to just come in for the sermon. My first line of my service, and I think I'm seeing things because I see the Easter bunny sneaking in the back of the church, sitting down in the back of the church. But it gets better. Because when I get to the end and we play a song and I do an altar call, I ask people if they want to commit their lives to Jesus to come forward and to pray with me. And I look up and the Easter Bunny's coming forward right down the middle of the aisle. And as the song plays, people are lined up to pray with me and he's just lined up with all the other people just moving up one person at a time. And he gets to me, puts his hand, paw, whatever, on my shoulder. And he, inside, he's a broken man, and on the outside, he still has the goofy Easter bunny grin on his face. And that man went on to find, not only find Jesus, become super involved in our children's ministry. How perfect is that, the Easter bunny as your children's minister? But short-term mission trips and so on. So what I'm saying is, what did we see there? That church service changed the flavor of that congregation. It gave that congregation a vision for why Jesus invented church. Because they saw with their own eyes Jesus putting together, you know, an East Coast casino guy, Pasquale, and tech people from an opposing uh, casino, and uh, the Easter Bunny, and a motley crew from very diverse backgrounds, and he knit us together into a team that loved one another. I marvel at it still today. But that's just one example of what Jesus always does. If we keep our hearts and our eyes open, he builds his church to show the world God's love in our diversity. The bottom line is this. Church community it may be hard. It may be countercultural. It may be messy. But Jesus endorsed it. Jesus loves it. Jesus created it. Jesus invented it. Because church is the only place you can truly learn to love so NBCC, you got a great thing going here. You really do love one another. Jesus loves you. You love Jesus. You love each other. So let's keep doing it together. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me right now? Let's pray together. Let's bow our heads. You know, with our heads bowed, just everybody just bow your head and close your eyes. Because the first step to being part of God's community is to accept Jesus' offer when he says to follow me. And so if you haven't yet, I just want to invite you to tell them in your heart, Lord, I received that invitation. I don't fully understand that. I have a lot of questions, but I know that's okay. You're going to help me grow. Now, others here have already made that commitment, but, but maybe you're realizing you haven't really been in community. You can pray, Lord, help me commit to being part of community. And Lord, thank you for NBCC. Bless NBCC. Bless Pastor Herman and Rhonda and the whole church family. I pray that they continue to be the community of Jesus Christ, radiating your love, and that they would know how much they are loved by you and spread that love to the Bay Area. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, and thanks for listening.